Hey everyone, welcome back to Church Online, to Grace Online. I think we're week number eight. Man, it feels like a whole year has gone by without us seeing you face to face. We miss you. We miss you so much. And we are planning and strategizing on how and when we're going to gather safely back together. So stay up to date on our website with at gracesd.tv backslash updates. That's where we're going to keep everyone posted. But besides that, we want you to know all the platforms that we're on today. So if one gets funky, you've got some other backups that you can go to. We have, of course, we're on Facebook Live, we're on YouTube, we're right on our Grace Church app. You can click there or you can go to our website, gracesd.tv and find the web slider, click on that and it will start us up right there as well. So lots of different platforms we're on. We wanna make sure that not only are you engaging with us right now and your family or whoever's with you in your quarantined home, but you're also engaging online with the community. And so get on that chat box and say hello and and, and say amens and, and shout us down. But more importantly, we also want you to share this, especially if you're on Facebook. Go ahead right now. Just do that little button that says share. Share it to your page and invite your family and friends to come and be a part of Grace Today. You never know who's going to pop on and the word that they're going to get and the seed that's going to get planted. So thanks for doing that. All right, everybody, get ready. We're going to worship the Lord and we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. So whatever you're doing, if you're in your pajamas, if you're doing the dishes, you can do both, by the way. (laughs) Uh, Grab the kids, turn up the volume on the TV or the computer and sing along with us, engage with us. Let's lift up the name of Jesus together. Let's sing together. Come on, here we go. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Amen. 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are
Isaiah 61, Isaiah the prophet begins to prophesy about our coming Savior. He starts describing Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it goes on in verse 3, describing some things that he was going to do for his people, for his church, for his bride. And that's for you. It says this. It says that he will give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And as I was researching and diving into God's word this week about what that means, I just wanted to share with you some encouragement about the beauty of what those words mean and the promise it means for you and I in our time of need. The beauty for ashes actually means that God is going to place a tiara. I know that's kind of girly right now, but he's going to place a crown, a tiara that signifies worth, value, and royalty upon ashes, which signifies worthlessness. How amazing is that? Some of you that feel worthless today, our Jesus is saying, let me wipe that worthlessness away and place a crown upon your head, calling you beautiful. It doesn't stop there. He says he's giving oil of joy for mourning. The oil of joy means he's going to give fatness of gladness fatness of gladness. Now listen, fatness is normally something we're trying to shed, but in this frame, it's a very good thing. Fatness of gladness, riches, abundance of gladness. For what? For mourning. But the mourning is specifically for things that are dead. So it's those things that are dead in your life, the dreams, the hopes, the plans that you may have had in this season of your life that seem to be dead, the business that seems dead in the water right now, the graduation plans, the marriage plans, the wedding plans, the financial plans, the vacation plans, those things that you were setting up for your future that might seem dead in the water right now. Our Jesus was prophesied over saying that he would come and give us fatness and riches of gladness, rejoicing, and welcome in replacement of those things. And lastly, he says that he will give us garments of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Those garments of praise look like a cloak or something that we wrap around. Just imagine like a fuzzy blanket that you just you just wrap around. But this kind of garment is the one that invokes and shows everyone the shine and the brilliance of who you are. It's a beautiful cloak that causes you to radiate glory, God's glory and praise instead of the spirit of heaviness and listen to what this means the spirit of heaviness is that mindset of weakness especially and specifically referring to a wick on a candle that's about to go out where it's about to lose its flame god is saying if you're tired right now if you feel like your flame is getting dull it is getting tired that he's going to come even in your mind and in your body and in your soul and in your emotions that he's going to come and replace that dimness that you feel inside of you right now with a garment of praise. I love the Word of God. I love it because the Bible says that it is living and active in our lives. When we breathe in and take in God's Word, it goes to work within us. And today, I want you to grab a hold of those promises. You might need beauty for ashes right now. You might need oil of joy instead of mourning today. You might need a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Whatever you need, Need. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are saying, I am here to give that to you today, right here, right now. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray for you today. Join with me in your faith. Jesus, we welcome you. We honor you in our lives. We put you on the throne of our emotions, our plans, our agendas, Lord, our families, our decisions. We just let you be boss even right now. And Lord, even as we do that, Lord, we surrender and we say, God, here is our ashes. Here is my mourning of dead things in my life. And God, here are the areas in my life where there is dimness and weakness and fatigue. 
Lord, would you come with the breath of your Holy Spirit even now and do what only you can do. Lord, where you take our ugly and you exchange it with something so radically opposite, so rich and so full and so beautiful. God, I pray wherever people are at today, at whatever state of mind that they are in, God, I thank you that you see each and every one of us right where we are. And Lord, that you are personal enough to know every detail that we need, but you are big enough to handle it all. And so God, we surrender it to you and say, we choose you, we trust you, and we invite you to come and make an exchange with us this morning. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Grace Church. We are so glad you joined us and we hope you have an amazing experience. Here are some things we think you should know about us. We love God's presence, believe in the power of prayer, and rely upon His Word. We believe one moment in the presence of God can change everything and that there is nothing more powerful than God's written and spoken Word. It can truly set us free. We are real people with real struggles, but more importantly, we serve a God who loves us and cares about us and will meet us exactly where we are. If you have a prayer request, we want to partner with you. Go to gracesd.tv to let us know what your requests are, and you can be confident our prayer team is praying over you every day this week. We are blessed to be a blessing and believe in giving back to God the first 10% of our income. As you give today, you can give online at gracesd.tv, use the Grace Ocean Side app, or text GRACESD to 77977 for a secure and easy way to give. Take a look at what's coming up at Grace. We will continue with online services. You can tune into our services on Facebook, YouTube, and our Grace Church app. Gather your family around the television or computer and have church in your living room with worship, prayer, and a great message from Pastor Matthew. We have also put on hold all of our events, midweek services, outreaches, and classes during the month of April. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for the latest updates. You can also visit our website or check out our app for the most up-to-date news on services and events. During our season of online services, our teens can check in daily on Instagram for daily Bible studies, prayer, community, and fun. Be sure to follow at Anthem North County so your teens can stay connected. Grace Church, we are so proud of you for showing up and bringing donations to the church. We've been able to be a distribution center for those in need in our community and for those in need in our own church. We've been able to hand out dozens upon dozens of bags of groceries and essential supplies to those who are in need. And we want to continue to do that. Every Tuesday between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., our church will be open for you to bring essential foods and essential supplies. If you have any questions at all, email Rebecca at gracesd.tv. We want to stay connected with you. Check out all of our new Zoom groups that are available. We have multiple groups meeting at all different times of the week, including ones for teens and kids. We are constantly adding groups, so be sure to check out the latest updates on gracesd.tv. To stay up to date with everything, follow us on social media at Grace North County or go to gracesd.tv. We look forward to seeing you soon. Meanwhile, connect with us online, and if you're in need, email us at info at gracesd.tv. Hey everybody, welcome to another Sunday Grace Online Church. We're so glad that you're joining us. If you are a guest, we want to give you a special welcome. However you ended up finding us, maybe somebody tagged you, invited you, drug you to their house. I don't know how you're watching, but we are glad that you are here with us and we can't wait to meet you in person. I want to give a special thank you to every single person here at Grace that helped over these past couple of weeks gathering resource so we can give to those in our community that are in need. You guys went above and beyond, and I was so proud of you. Thank you guys, those of you that brought stuff, those of you that were able to serve and distribute uh, stuff to our community and help with food. You guys did an incredible job. Thank you for your servant's heart and your generosity. I also want to thank all of our givers here at Grace. Once again, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude for those that are faithfully sowing into the ministry of Grace Church. Thank you guys for helping us reach people, for moving forward in these days and doing ministry. 
We're so grateful for each and every one of you. And I'm, I want you to know I'm praying that God's blessing you. I'm praying that God's going to bless you in the midst of all of this craziness. How many are glad that God's not limited to man's economies shutting down? Like when the banks close down, you can close down the economy, you can close down businesses, but God can still open up the windows of heaven in your life. And that's what I'm praying for you today. And uh, I'm grateful that even in the midst of famine, that God can prosper his people. There's something supernatural that happens when we put God first. And I've seen that in my life, in many of your lives and your stories. We see that throughout the word of God. Jesus actually spoke about this in Matthew's gospel. He said, when you seek first the kingdom of God, Everything that we get concerned about, the things we eat, the things we drink, the things we're going to wear, all the earthly things that tend to consume our thinking. He says, if you put first the kingdom of God, all those things are added unto you. And God says, I'll take care of that. Just put me first. And so when we worship the Lord in our giving and bringing the tithes and the offerings, it's our way of saying, God, we are putting you first in our finances. And I'm so proud to be part of a church that is generous and faithful in that area. And if you'd like to be a part of the ministry here and help us reach people and share the good news of Jesus, you can be a part of that right now, right today. You can join up and this little screen below is going to show you some way right in this area that you can safely and conveniently be a part of the ministry here at Grace. Thank you so much. I'm excited today because we are in week number two of a series that we are calling Organic Church. We're going back to the early church, the raw church, the, the early church that was all natural, the, the church without all of the additives of, of man like tradition and religion and styles and preferences that tend to build up over the years. And before long, you end up looking at the church and start thinking things like, that doesn't look like the church that Jesus said he was going to build. And it's during these times that we're in, I, I sense God is reemphasizing and reprioritizing what really is essential within his church. And we are looking at the early church to discover what's organic. What, what is the church really supposed to be about? What are the main things and how do we keep the main things the main things? And we began last week, so you got to go back to last week if you want to get caught up because we're jumping right back in today. And our theme verse is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus declared, he said, on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said, I will build my church. It speaks of his ownership, and it speaks of what he's building here on planet Earth. When he says, I'm going to build my church, by the way, he is not thinking or foreseeing a, a, a wooden structure, a, a brick-and-mortar building with a steeple and stained glass windows, although that's wonderful and beautiful. That's not necessarily the church Jesus had in mind. When Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, we need to understand the context of the day in which he was speaking. The word church is actually, actually in the Greek language, the word ekklesia. And it's a beautiful, powerful word. It's so much more than a building or a place. It is a gathering of people that are called out they're called out to gather, but they're not just gathering for the sake of gathering. They're not just getting together because they need somebody to hang out with. They're not just coming together for another church potluck. That's not what he's talking about when he says, I'm going to call out my ecclesia. There are people that are going to gather. They're going to be called out of a public arena, and they're going to actually legislate some authority. That's what the word in the context of the day held, that, that there was a, a legislature of authority given to these people. And so essentially, Jesus is saying, I'm going to have a group of people that are going to implement my kingdom of heaven here on planet earth. This will be the church I build. So that if you want to know what heaven looks like, what heaven thinks like, what heaven is about, all you need to do is go find somebody that is a part of his ecclesia, and you'll get a little taste of heaven here on planet earth. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, if you really want to get a good idea of what the ecclesia, what the church really is supposed to be like and be about, we've got to go to the book of Acts. In the New Testament, the book of Acts follows the, the gospels. It really is a continuation of the gospels, if you will. It's a blueprint 
for what the early church looked like, how they functioned, and how they operated. And one of the dominating characteristics, really a prominent uh, factor in the early church, was the fact that they were filled with the Spirit. And I want to talk about that today, being filled with the Spirit, because I think it's an essential element and attribute that must be part of the church this day and in our era right now, that we are filled with the Spirit of God. Paul would say this way in Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse 18. He would say, don't be drunk with wine. Why? Because that will ruin your life. Instead, Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't come under the influence of wine. Rather, come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Today, I want to take our few moments and I want to speak to you from the subject of under the influence. Some of you today need to get up under the influence. I don't know who you're sitting with right now. I don't know who's around you. Maybe you got your kids in the PJs all over the floor. Maybe your spouse is there. Even if you're alone in a parking lot, yell it out the window and tell somebody in the vicinity of your area, you need to get under the influence. Some of you need to get under the influence today. And I want to talk to you about that. I, uh, I'm like many of you, and I appreciate, actually, I, I love a good cup of coffee. I start my morning out every morning. I'm like a robot, same thing, same place. It's kind of, it really is like Groundhog's Day, especially now. I go down, let the dogs out, hit the Keurig button, and uh, I like my coffee black. I know some of you, you like a little bit of coffee with your sugar and cream. No, I, I go all black. Here's why. Because I need, I need that to hit me fast and furious. I need it to come quick. And, and, and our, our culture, our society has an infatuation with coffee today, don't they? In fact, it's become a staple in our society. And one of the things we depend upon on coffee to do is very simple. It's a stimulant to launch us into our day. See, if things become drowsy, if things become weary, if things become tiresome, coffee is appealed to so that its caffeine can give us a pick, pick me up. Well, I want you to understand today that God has given you a, a stimulator. God has given us a stimulus. God has given us an enabler, an empowerment. It is the person that the Bible calls the Holy Spirit, the third member of the triune Godhead. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is very simple. I want to try to take a very complicated and and and. For, for many, a confusing subject that we could honestly spend weeks on and, and really simplify this today. The, the, the basic job of the Holy Spirit really is to empower us, to enable us, to stimulate us, to live the life that Jesus has called us to live, to live our lives with mission. And he is called to empower us to do this. Jesus is all about mission. And I want you to understand today, Jesus' mission has not changed. He came with a mission. He has the same mission today. Jesus' mission. He actually said what he came for in his mission. He said, he said, I've come, or the Son of Man has come, to seek and to save the lost. Jesus says, my mission is a search and rescue mission. That's always been his mission. And that is still his mission here on planet Earth. Now, he got this thing started a couple thousand years ago when he came, God in the flesh. God came from heaven to Earth. Jesus spent 33 years on planet Earth. Jesus lived a sinless life, yet he would die a sinner's death. They would hang him on a cross, which he allowed them to do because he would be the savior of the world and his sacrifice would make forgiveness possible. And Jesus died on the cross. They put him in the tomb. He stayed there for three days. We learned this a couple weeks ago. Thank God he didn't stay there, but God raised him up out of the grave. He couldn't stay in the tomb. And what I find very interesting is Jesus spent 40 days on planet earth. It wasn't like he came out of the grave and just 
like beam me up, Scotty, and went right to heaven. That's not how it went down. Jesus spent over a month, 40 days exactly, walking with people, talking with people, touching with people, embracing people, having dinner with people. One time the disciples, they were scared, locked in a room. Jesus just, he, he walked right through the walls in his resurrected body, which I think is absolutely incredible. And so Jesus, 40 days with the disciples, he's getting the church ready. And, and, and it's in that time frame of that window of opportunity that Jesus begins to reemphasize and clarify what the mission of the church is. Now, he, he talked about this earlier before the cross, but he's really honing in these final moments of what the mission is. We've come to call this the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Another gospel would word it a little bit differently, that we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced at this point the disciples were jazzed. I think they were rearing to go. Like, okay, our Savior, he's alive. He is who he says he is. If death can't hold him down, nothing can hold us down. And they were excited to go and do the mission. And Jesus gave the great commission he says go but I want you to wait it might have confused the disciples just a little bit go but wait he says go because this is your mission but hold on don't don't no, just wait 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 because there's something rather someone you need to go with you. And this is where we pick up in Acts chapter 1, verse number 3. Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command Do not leave Jerusalem. Look at this. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Just wait. Wait for what? For the gift my father promised. Jesus had already talked about this earlier before the cross, that there would be a promise of a helper, an advocate, talking about the person of the Holy Spirit, which you have heard me speak about. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now let's bump forward just a few verses. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Their mission was directly connected to an empowerment that came through a filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, at this point, Jesus, once he gave these final words, he's like, peace, I'm out. And he ascended, the Bible says, and they watched him as he, like a balloon in the sky, disappeared in the sky where he would ascend to heaven and sit at the right hand of his father. They stood there for a while and they're like, well, we better go and do what he said. In fact, some angels came and said, go do what he said. And they gathered in a room. In fact, it was 10 days after that. So a total of 50 days from resurrection, the day of Pentecost. We find in Acts chapter 1, excuse me, Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rest upon each one of them. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Right here, Jesus set apart his church to get full of the Holy Spirit so that they would have the power to go and do everything that he wanted them to do. There's a few things about the Holy Spirit I just want to clarify. First of all, I want you to understand that we receive the Holy Spirit the very moment that we are saved. Some would debate this. Some would argue this. Say, no, you don't get the Holy Spirit then. But I'm, I'm telling you, according to Scripture, the Holy Spirit is received at the moment of salvation. In fact, according to Scripture, you don't even get to Jesus without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. He is the one that draws you and woos you and assists you and gets you to Jesus for salvation. But some would say, no, you don't have the Holy Spirit at salvation. I'm telling you, yes, you do. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says this, you cannot indeed be a Christian at all. All unless you have something of his spirit in you. When you come to Christ at that very moment, there is what is called an 
indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life. That means the Holy Spirit takes up residence on the inside of you. And I want you to understand today, he will never leave you. You are indwelled permanently with perpetuity, meaning he's locked in. It is sealed. It is secure. The very moment there is an indwelling. But I also want you to understand that the filling of the Holy Spirit is subsequent and an ongoing process. This is not a one-time event, but as, as often as you need it, as often as you want it, the filling of the Holy Spirit is different than the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let, let me illustrate it like this. This will help you understand it. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is like an engine that you place inside of an automobile. It's there. The filling of the Holy Spirit is like the fuel in the tank. So when you go to the gas station, or if you're a little bit older in years, you may still call it the filling station. You go to the filling station, they're not going to put a new motor in your car. They're going to put some fresh fuel in your car. And here's why. The reason you get filled is in order to be fueled. And the reason you get fueled is because you have somewhere to go. So you get filled to get fueled to do something. It's at the filling station. If you don't get filled up with some fresh fuel, you're not going anywhere. And so in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, if you read on in the book of Acts, this early organic church, you'll see that on the day of Pentecost, it wasn't the only time they got filled with the Holy Spirit. It was ongoing. It was a subsequent event in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says that after they prayed, these are the same people. Just a lot has happened between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. They prayed. The place where they were meeting together, it was shaken. Something very similar now. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Why did they get filled again? Because they needed to get filled again for what they were dealing with in the moment in that situation. I want to let you know today that the church cannot function. I am thoroughly convinced of this. The church cannot function or even attempt to fulfill the Great Commission without a relationship and a reliance upon the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, his assignment for your life is just too big for you. His assignment for my life, his assignment for this church is too big for us to pull off by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to come and influence us, to fill us, or what is called to baptize us. There, there are three things that we need to be empowered. And this is what the Holy Spirit will empower you to do. First of all, I hope you write this down. By the way, if you need notes, those are available for you on YouVersion Bible app. You can grab those right now and track along with us. If you can't get to those, write it on a piece of paper. Get it on your phone. But I want you to understand this. Number one, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live righteously. You've got you to understand this. This is so important. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live righteously. Now, here's how this works. You might be thinking, wait a minute, Matthew, when I got saved, I became righteous. And the, the answer is yes, that is correct. When we are saved, the moment we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Bible says that, that, that we are forgiven that he forgives our sins, he cleanses us from sin. We are made blameless before God. We are righteous. And Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There is an exchange that happens at the very moment of salvation where now God looks at me, and not because I'm awesome, but because my Savior is awesome, God sees righteousness covering my life. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In that moment, I am made righteous positionally. But we need to understand the difference between being righteous and walking in righteousness. To live righteous, to do righteous, to step into righteous. Have you noticed? Maybe it was only me. I don't think it was, though. But when I got saved, I realized, man, I'm forgiven, I'm cleansed, I'm righteous, I feel different. And the next day, there were still things I did, things I thought, things I said that didn't line up with my position of righteousness. Am I the only one? 
and you realize, man, I, I'm not always walking in righteousness. Well, the truth is Jesus makes us righteous at the cross, but it's the Holy Spirit power that enables us day in and day out to walk in righteousness and do a work on the inside of us. Look at the scripture in Romans 8 verse 9. You, however, are controlled or or influenced, not by the sinful nature. He's talking to Christians here. But by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And so when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He begins to do a transforming work on the inside of you. I love Philippians 2. I believe it's verse 13 that says, It is God who does the work in you and through you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. And so there's a... There's something happening in our heart. There's something that happens in our motives. There's there's something that begins to happen in our thinking. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 puts it so beautifully and tells us that this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of debate and argument over what the evidence of the Holy Spirit is. Some would say, well, it's the speaking of tongues, or it's this, or it's that, and I'm all for speaking in tongues. I'm all for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I think that's wonderful. I think that's beautiful. But biblically, scripturally, you want to know what the evidence of the Holy Spirit is in your life or the fruit of the Holy Spirit is? Look no further than Galatians chapter 5. Listen, I, I've, met, I've met people that speak in tongues, and they don't have this fruit right here. And it makes me wonder. Paul says, you want to know what the fruit of the Spirit is. When the Holy Spirit, look at this, verse 22, when the Holy Spirit controls you or influences you, our lives will produce this kind of fruit or evidence in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So this is what begins to bubble up out of our life and begins to steer the steps of our life when the Holy Spirit is taking influence over us. If we are living now, it says, by the Holy Spirit's power, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Listen, it's really hard. I would say it's really hard and it's really impossible to be a Christian without the divine enablement of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. It's hard. You can't do it. I've had people come up to me and say, this whole Christian thing, it's impossible. And I say, you're right. It is impossible for you to do it. It's impossible. That's why we need God to work in us and through us, both the will and to do for his good pleasure. The Holy Spirit will enable us to live and to walk in righteousness. Not only that, he'll empower you in this second way. The Holy Spirit empowers me to live supernaturally. This is amazing. How many would agree that Jesus lived a supernatural life? Oh yeah, just read about what he did. Healings, raising the dead, miracles, signs and wonders. And Jesus is actually a prototype of what a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit life actually looks like. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The reason Jesus did this is because Jesus was anointed. You say, no, he was God. That's why he did all the miracles. He's God. He's the Messiah. And that's why he could raise the dead. Well, listen, when Jesus came to earth, the Bible says he humbled himself, set aside his powers. And what, what actually empowered Jesus to do ministry and to do the miraculous was not the fact that he was God. It was the fact that the Holy Spirit descended and remained upon him and empowered him in his ministry to people. He becomes a prototype of what is available for you and I as spirit-empowered believers. And so the book of Acts is the story of the disciples receiving what Jesus received so they could do what Jesus did. John 14, verse 12, Jesus is talking. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works. Not just that, not just the same works I've done, but even greater works because I'm going to the Father. Verse Corinthians 2, verse 4, Paul says this, My message and my preaching 
We're not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Paul's saying, listen, I don't want my stories. I don't want my, my speeches. I don't want my talks. I don't want my jokes. I don't want what I put together in my man-made uh, ideas and creativity. I don't want any of that to be what you're clinging to. We, we need to have a demonstration of God's power. Paul said this is what accompanied the church. This is what accompanied his messages and the most prominent feature you will find in the early church was a supernatural power. And I would suggest that's what we need to see in the church today. The book of Acts is full of ordinary people that are doing extraordinary things. The Holy Spirit empowers me to live supernaturally. Thirdly, I want you to see this. The Holy Spirit, he empowers me to live on mission. Oh yeah, he empowers me to, to live righteously to live supernaturally, and to live with mission. God has asked us to do something we are not qualified to do. You may have heard this before, that God does not call the qualified, yet he will always qualify the called. And God will equip you. God will empower you. We're going we're gonna to need his Holy Spirit to pull off what he's asked us to do. I want to remind you that his mission for your life, his mission for this church is so much bigger than just you and me. And so Jesus, Jesus, again, was always on mission. In Luke chapter 4, in verse number 18, Jesus, he just came up out of the waters of baptism. The Holy Spirit remained and sat upon him. He went in the wilderness for 40 days, and then he walked into a synagogue. He walked into a church, pulled out a scroll from Isaiah, and he declared this in Luke 4, verse 18. This is what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You want to know what his mission is? It's right here. To preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus' mission has not changed. It is the same mission that he passed on to his disciples and it's the same mission he passed on to the church and it's the same mission that we carry today. In the Gospels, Christ issued the commands to his followers to take the Gospel and to go to the ends of the earth. And in the book of Acts, we get a glimpse of just how the apostles responded to those commands under the guidance and leadership of the Holy Spirit. What I find interesting about the book of Acts, I just just discovered this today. It is one of the few books in the New Testament that does not close with the word amen. You go look through the closing of all the books in the New Testament. Only a couple of them close without the word amen because the book of Acts is only the only book in the book of, of, of the Bible that is unfinished. It closes with the continued preaching of the gospel and what that means for you and I is that our lives are to help complete the book of Acts throughout the ages. Meaning it's not done yet. We carry it now. Listen, God's promise to you is a Holy Spirit. Paul came to some believers in Acts chapter 19 and asked the question, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. He's here denoting that there's the distinction between being saved, being a believer, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, this is what Peter said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. You want to know who the Holy Spirit is available to? Anyone that calls on him. Anyone who wants him. All you have to do is ask and receive. You don't even have to beg for the Holy Spirit. You don't even have to ask him to come. He came on the day of Pentecost. He is here. He is available to those who would welcome him and receive him into their life. 
I grew up in church and I thought the Holy Spirit was weird. I did. I grew up in a Pentecostal charismatic environment. And I saw people, and I said, what are they doing? And someone would say, well, they got the Holy Ghost. And I said, well, I, if that's what the Holy Ghost does. I don't want the Holy Ghost. And I kind of lived my life that way until I was 21 years old. And then you know what I did? When I was 21 years old, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I was okay with God the Father. I was okay with God the Son. But God the Holy Spirit, I'm not so sure about you. You just mind your own business. Because I had a misunderstanding about who the Holy Spirit was. And I began to read through the book of Acts. I began to read through the Gospels and see what Jesus said about the promise. And I discovered that this Holy Spirit, this person, is wonderful. He's a friend. He's safe. And he wants to reside in me and fill me on a daily basis so I can walk out a life of victory, power, and authority. Listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird the Holy Spirit makes you powerful. If you ever see someone that's weird and they say they got the Holy Spirit, I just want you to know they would be weird with or without the Holy Spirit. They just are weird. The Holy Spirit will make you powerful. His gifts are available. His fruit is available. And I want to encourage you today to welcome him into your life. Welcome him into your family. He's available to those that ask. So right now, would you just take these moments and just close your eyes and just bow your head? Can we pray together? Maybe if you're even able and willing just to turn your hands like you're receiving a gift because that's truly what the Holy Spirit is. He is a gift. Just begin to ask, Holy Spirit, I receive you. I welcome you into my life. Come fill me. Baptize me fresh. Let a fresh wind from heaven blow into the sails of my life. Let it be overflowing. Bring me fuel, God, to sustain me, to move into what you've called me to do, to what you called me to be, Lord. Empower me, Holy Spirit, to live righteously. Empower me, Holy Spirit, to begin to walk and, and move in the supernatural. Empower me, Holy Spirit, to live on mission and fulfill the mission you've called me to. God, I pray that that would be a mark of this house and this church, that this is a place the Holy Spirit is moving, a place that the Holy Spirit is welcome, that there would be a demonstration of your power in Jesus' name. Right where you're at today, if you're listening and you say, Matthew, I don't even, I don't even know about all this stuff that you're talking about. I don't know about this Jesus. And maybe you're here and you're kicking the tires trying to figure some things out and you got questions. And I want you to know I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And I would love nothing more than to lead you in a prayer of faith and confession, a starting point, an introduction to begin to know this Jesus that we're talking about, this Savior that came from heaven to earth and made salvation possible. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Only Jesus offers salvation. Only Jesus offers us a right relationship with God. Only Jesus offers us heaven by his own admission. He is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. If you're listening, if you're watching today and you say, Matthew, I'd like to know this Jesus. I, I'm not right with God. I don't know him. Or maybe you've prayed a prayer before, but nothing changed or you walked away. Maybe for the first time you need to make a commitment or the second time or the third time you need to come back and recommit. Wherever you're at in your journey, in your story, let's pray together right now. I'll help you with the words. You pray this from your heart today. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I surrender to you. I'm done running. And I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I believe in my heart that God's raised you from the dead. So let my life never be the same. Lord, cleanse me, forgive me. Live on the inside of me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that from this day forward, I would follow you. My life would bring you glory and honor. We thank you today, Jesus. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've been here before, you know what I'm about to say. We are proud of you for making that decision to make Jesus Christ not just your Savior, but Lord of your life. That you invited him in not just to get you to eternity, but to come and be boss and to call the shots in your life. And we want to make sure that as you are beginning your journey to being a Christ follower, that we want to put into your hands, into your 
phone and to your inbox uh, the appropriate tools, the necessary tools for you to take the next steps in your walk with Christ. So this is what we would love for you to do. If you made that decision today for the very first time, would you do us a favor? Would you text to 97000, text the words, Amazing Grace, all smushed together. Amazing Grace to 97000. And as you do that, that will let us know that you've made that decision to follow Christ today and we'll be able to get you some resources. Welcome home. Welcome to the family. All of heaven is rejoicing right now because of that eternal decision that you made. We're so proud of you and we love you. You guys have a great day and we'll see you at Wednesday Night Live, 7 p.m. on Facebook.